Camp. Civic Camp is a nonpartisan public advocacy group enabling citizens to engage in creating a city that works for us all. Any Calgarian is welcome to become a Civic Camper by visiting civiccamp.org, learning more about the organization, what values Civic Camp members have set out for ourselves, and join up with a group that interests them. One of Civic Camp's groups is the <coughs> governance, the governance Cabin. This group decided that the best way to raise public awareness of civic issues during the election was to host a forum in each ward, something that we pioneered last election in 2010. Thank you tonight. Thank yous tonight go to the Civic Camp volunteers who donated their time to make uh, these events a reality. Thanks to the Winston Heights Mountview Community Association for letting us use their hall. Thanks to Calgary Sound Rentals and the Calgary Roadrunners for providing equipment for tonight's forum at a significantly reduced rate. <laughs> thanks, thanks to our media partners, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, and Metro Calgary. Thanks to the Calgary Association of Parent and Schools Councils and the Alberta Teachers Association for supporting the school board trustee citizens forums that we've been running simultaneously. Thanks to the Students Union of Mount Royal University who were our Ward 11 citizens forum partner and the University of Calgary Students Union who were our Ward 1 and mayoral citizens forum partners. Thanks to the Calgary Foundation for helping us pay the few bills that uh, we did rack up. And finally, thanks to the citizens of Calgary for supplying our questions and to the Ward 9 councillor candidates for joining us tonight. Okay. There are some ground rules for tonight's forum. I'll just have to go through them quickly with you so you know what's happening. We've named these, we've named these forums Citizens Forums because the questions for the first part of the, uh, the event have come directly from Calgarians. Civic Camp asked Calgarians what to ask at these forums and hundreds of questions were submitted, thousands of votes were recorded for the questions, and the top voted questions are what we'll be focusing on tonight. Uh, tonight, two candidates will have two minutes to respond to each question I ask. But because we don't have enough time for all four candidates to answer every question, we're giving them three poker chips each, which they can cash in at their leisure for an extra minute of time. So once I select randomly two candidates to answer a question, they'll have two minutes to respond, and then the other candidates will have a chance to cash in a chip if they want to answer that same question for one minute. The few standard rules of etiquette are respect the clock. We have a timer and a flag person to help, so we'll, I will let you uh, finish your sentence or your thought if you go over your time limit, but otherwise we'll stop at the time limit. Uh, please make it easy for the audience to listen. Don't interrupt each other, candidates, when, when each other is speaking. Uh, please avoid personal references and let the audience decide. We ask that campaign supporters and cheer cheerleaders, etc., uh, maintain decorum inside this hall. If you want to campaign uh, and cheer, you can do that outside in the lobby or outside afterwards, but in here we, we try to be quiet and respectful. I will read a bunch of questions from the online survey. We'll have a short intermission, hopefully around 10 after 8. We'll start again with more questions and a, a how round, a lightning round of questions based on each candidate's platform, campaign platform, uh, and we'll try to wrap up around 9 o'clock, if not a couple of minutes, maybe late. So, without further ado, two minutes for introductions go to White Jordan. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. Oh. <laughs> Volume check. For inviting me here tonight. My name is Jordan Katz, and I'd like to represent you as your next city councillor. I have spent the last several months attending events and meeting families at their doors, and I have been incredibly humbled by the response that I have received on the over 11,000 doors that I have knocked on so far. I love door knocking as I believe there is no better way to get to know a community than to meet at one family at a time. I have heard about every issue, whether their scope is small or large, and let me just say, when you have to live with something on a daily basis, there are no small issues. My experience so far has reinforced within me my belief that Calgary is a great city filled with amazing people. I am proud to call Calgary my home. 
Affordability, traffic congestion, and how our community is represented at City Hall are the three issues that I hear about most. Tonight, I wanna to focus on the first issue, affordability. In the last three years, property taxes have risen by 30% for the average Calgary home. To put that into perspective, two of the three last, two of the three years have seen the largest tax increases in Calgary's history. So two out of the last three years have seen the largest tax increases in the history of our city. Tax increases for the last three years have exceeded the total tax increases for the nine years that Bronconye was mayor. Two groups that are most impacted by these increases are seniors living on fixed incomes and young families just getting started in life. My friend John Carlo voted for every tax increase over the last three years. He voted to take away your $52 million and he is committed to taking it away again this year. Now they are talking about a 14% tax increase for next year and you can bet that my friend to my right will, will be supporting that as well. On October 21st, that is why I think there is no better reason to support me, Jordan Katz, as your next city councillor. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Next, Blue. Giancarlo, two minutes. Mic check, mic check, one, two. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here tonight, and I want to thank everybody for uh, waiting an extra half hour so that we candidates who participate in the UDI forum in the deep south of this city were able to participate there and come here. Uh, I'm standing before you asking for your vote for re-election, or sitting before you, as the case may be, because I never dreamed of being a politician. I had a very interesting career in sustainable urban design, and I had the opportunity to work with cities across North America, changing how they grew, developing processes and, and uh, rules and regulations so they could really get a handle on growing smarter. And in my spare time, I spent a tremendous amount of time with East Calgary communities, helping develop community-based visions and taking those visions to City Hall. Uh, I made the decision about four years ago that the difference between leading practice across North America in terms of community engagement, in terms of redeveloping uh, a city of great neighborhoods and creating a city that was more transit-based was so far detached from where we were going in Calgary. We were talking about it, we weren't making the necessary changes. So I made the drastic decision to become an actual elected official. I was unbelievably honored to be elected Ward 9's counselor, and I was amazingly honored to get elected alongside someone who's turned out to be an amazing mayor. And we are in the process of transforming how the city of Calgary works. In 2010, I said we have to change how city council works, we have to change city hall, and we have to change Calgary. And that work is deeply underway, and I'm extremely excited about what we have in store for the next four years. I believe that great cities are made of great neighborhoods and it's an honor to represent the great neighborhoods of Ward 9 and work with you to make them even better. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. All right, hey, it's good day, everybody. Uh, I was here quite a bit earlier than everybody else. I don't know why they took so long. But anyway, as we all do now, we reflect the way they do work later on. Anyways, one of the uh, issues I look at is how our neighborhoods are going and how the whole city as a whole is going. One, I'd like to see some gray water happening. You know, our parks are getting a lot of Javax bleeds thrown through it for our drinking water, which is wrong. You know, it should be gray water that we recycle properly. You know, make sure we get a good greenhouse effect. You know, making sure our moisture is in the uh, ground and that it properly uh, filters through. Uh, connecting with our community. This is one of the things I look at. Southland Drive, has anybody been down there? It just ends at the river. Why doesn't it go over to Quarry Park where it connects into River Bend, Quarry Park, and the new Imperial uh, Industrial Area where uh, Imperial Oil will be uh, doing their business. 99th Avenue is that area, okay? 50th Avenue, that should be an overpass all the way towards McLeod Trail. This will make truck traffic much easier business much easier, and it'll be an east-west flow for our communities and more connections, maybe making it easier for our transit. 
Okay, I want our uh, neighborhood, our, our zoo, placed in a safer area. You know, and this will help Inglewood develop its uh, commercial orientated uh, base. You know, and maybe hopefully they'll include Bridgeland with that, with the inner city transit, which should be cheaper than what city transit is now. All right, better access. You know, inner city tourism, that's one of the things that is lacking, you know, where the people can get out and meet their own neighborhood. You know, ah, sorry, you gotta wait for a bus that goes downtown and then you gotta wait for another hour to connect somewhere else where you wanna go. Where they could have just put a bus route around, you know. This is uh, realistic things. This is the things I look at, that's the way I roll, and I'd rather see us go forward than sit there in paperwork. Thank you. Okay, let's go. First question goes to Stan. Giancarlo, the question is, if you would like me to repeat the question, please let me know. Do you support legalization of secondary suites in all existing neighborhoods subject only to reasonable safety concerns? Why or why not? Stan. Secondary suites. Well, my view of this is basic. You know, if you're a homeowner and you want to develop your basement suite just to help out with the market, go right You know, if you're doing it for profit, make sure you follow the rules, make sure it's safe, and it should be taxed for the city. You know, I don't care you want to come into our neighborhoods take down a house, put in a duplex and rent the upstairs, downstairs, totally wrong. But if you're doing it for profit, you should pay to have it done. Sort of as a tax, a business license. You know, if you're profiting off the uh, backs of people that are working to pay your mortgage, you know, think about that. These people, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they should have a, uh, a, a set of rules in which, you know, if you don't have a swimming pool, you can't charge $2,500 a month for just a little space. You know, it should be real, it should be uh, reasonable, and it should be within the average of the Cal Canada average, you know, because, you know, realistic, you know, the areas that we see, $600 for a room is ridiculous, $1,200 for a uh, one bedroom is ridiculous, a, a, a lady that has a kid can't even afford that. And welfare won't help. You know, it should be more affordable, more realistic, and accountable to certain rules. No sauna, no jacuzzi. You don't charge the high rates. It should be real. Giancarlo, same question. Would you like to repeat it? I absolutely support the legalization of secondary suites across Calgary. And there are two principal reasons why this is the only intelligent way forward. Number one, we have up to 60,000 Calgary households living in illegal suites. So that is an unbelievably prevalent black market. And what we have are citizens who have no legal rights and who are probably living in very compromised safety environments. And the only control that the city of Calgary has now over those environments is to evict people onto the street. With a 0% rental rate, rental vacancy rate in this city right now, to start evicting people would be a human rights disaster. Uh, the other side of the coin is that it presents a tremendous opportunity, both for people who have space to let and for people who need space. And again, we have very low rental rate. I don't think that secondary suites are a panacea for solving affordability and affordable housing, but it is part of the spectrum of solutions that have to be available in a city of this size. And it is an important part of, of the affordability equation. Um, I think it's, you know, seniors, uh, startup families, this is not about creating rental slums. Anyone can rent every single room in their house if they want to. If you want to live in dignified separation from people, not have roommates, that's where the secondary suite comes in and it's crazy that we haven't created the opportunity. The other thing that everyone has to be aware of is that legalizing secondary suites across the city does not mean that we're going to have a proliferation of secondary suites. It's a first step towards addressing major issues in the city's land use bylaw and the Alberta Building Code. And there's no impetus to address those issues until there's a statement that these are important. Thank you.
Jordan, you know the rules that one chip is worth one minute, and you have three to last all night. Okay. If you'd like to answer this question, go ahead. Throw it into your, throw it into your cup. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the most important things to remember about secondary suites, the City of Calgary does not have the legal authority to approve secondary suites. They are regulated by the Alberta Building Code and the Alberta Fire Code. So in existing communities, there, there are two significant problems. First, the houses were never built to accommodate secondary suites. You need to have separate entrances, you need to have oversized windows, you need to have dual furnaces, you need to have fireproof insulation, fire alarms, and the list goes on and on. The cost to modify a house averages between 35,000 and $55,000 to turn a house that doesn't have a legal suite into a legal one. So even a blanket approval will not create legal suites within the city. Secondly, the existing streets um, do not have enough parking to accommodate all those additional cars for all those people. So that's something we have to remember. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. How will you ensure all Calgarians have access to the recreation and sports facilities they need for health and well-being? Question goes to Giancarlo first. Okay, well, one of the major reasons I went to City Council is because in my job, I recognized, my job was basically to help cities that were recognizing they were driving off a financial cliff, change their practice, and grow in a different way. And the reality is what we've done for decades in the city of Calgary is that we've taken the tax base from the existing area, we've subsidized growth on the edge. That growth has not collected enough taxes to cover the ongoing maintenance and service requirements of running this city. And decade after decade, what you start to open up is what the city of Calgary is confronted with, which is a $14 billion deficit between the revenues we collect and the expenses and obligations we have associated with running this city. So recreation is oftentimes something that falls off the side. Now the $52 million question that's currently up in the media is tax room that taxes we've already paid that uh, the province did not take from us months after we'd collected them from you guys. Uh, previous to the $52 million question that's before us, there was a $40 million question before us, and council, not in an election cycle, decided to take that money. And what we did is we established a dedicated fund for doing a number of things. Uh, keeping our fire halls open, supporting our civic partners like the zoo and Heritage Park, uh, and most building our central library, and most importantly, building the four recreation centers that the federal government had yanked funding on. We are now moving ahead with all four of those. We need to uh, make the argument that we need a lot more of the taxes that we're already paying staying in the city of Calgary and working for Calgarians. And that is one important component of getting out of the financial mess that we're in. I'll speak about this more throughout much. the night. Same question to uh, Jordan. Jordan. Stan. No. Jordan. Jordan. Oh, Jordan, White? Jordan. Sorry, Jordan. Can you repeat the question for me, please? Uh, read the question. How will you ensure all Calgarians have access to the recreation and sports facilities they need for ongoing health and well-being? Well, one of the things that I like about our city is we have a wealth of facilities available to us right now. Um, on a little side note, I almost joined the square dancing next door as I walked in, into the wrong door. But ultimately, um, what makes our city great is the fact that we have green space, we have bike paths, we have uh, just an incredible amount of facilities for, for us to participate in on a regular basis. And I think that's something that we should be proud of. And as a city, our goal should be to maintain and improve the facilities we have to make them more effective for the people living in those communities. And that's something I'm going to work towards. Thank you. 
Stan, you don't have to answer this. You can cash a chip if you want. Okay, that's one chip. Got to pay your chip <laughs> one into minute. the cup. <laughs> Recreation, healthy communities. I am shocked that our city hasn't made an effort to install these things into our community centers. You know, each one of our communities should have a nice basketball court so the kids in the neighborhood can uh, grow up and practice, so the adults can join in and play with the kids. There should be a swimming pool. This kind of stuff. You know, I'm just shocked that, you know, we got to go out to Village Square Mall or Deep South or, you know, way up in the north, you know, nothing where inner city people can actually enjoy. So if we look at our community center, like Renfrew down here, Bridgeland, you know, Inglewood, there's no swimming pool there. And the investment that we've done in these large conglomerate cons concepts is wrong. It should be small community, helps develop the community essence, help develop the kids into knowing your neighbors and help everybody get to know their neighborhood. And that's where I think the money should have been spent is within the community halls to make it a better rec center to help the community Thank you. also make money. Thanks. <laughs> Next question. With a vacancy rate approaching 0% in Calgary, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals, families, and students have a place to live in Calgary? Giancarlo. This is a really good question. And as a matter of fact, after several years of practice in urban design, I realized that I was contributing to the same issue that had confronted uh, the redevelopment of the Curry Barracks. Garrison Woods was intended to be a mixed income community. And it was such a desirable community that people were paying well above what was previously market rates to live in smaller and smaller places just to be part of that community. I found the same thing in my professional practice. You build a great neighborhood. Everyone wants to be there. And it's a supply and demand issue. People get uh, basically uh, priced out of the market. And having mixed income communities is absolutely essential to the development of a great neighborhood to the development of a great city, and to the development of a, of a civil society. I think that the solution has to be attacked across a broad spectrum. I actually went back and started my PhD in urban affordability and dropped out because my wife was doing her PhD at the same time, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> the point is we need to actually attack this on several fronts. Secondary suites is one of them. A whole mix of affordable housing options, attainable housing. Um, we need to uh, look at senior specific housing, and I've been very proud to be part of a couple of important uh, projects. There's one that's just opened in Dover today. There's one going up in Inglewood uh, that I was intimately involved with. We need to start looking at mandatory three-bedroom unit sizes for apartments. We need to look at inclusionary zoning, where every multifamily development has uh, a number of affordable suites built into it as part of the deal. We need to look at co-housing, and Winston Heights, of course, has an amazing example of that. There are so many different things, and they have to play within the context of a neighborhood. And we need a different regulatory and planning environment so these things can work together and play together better. And that's what's underway. Thank you. <laughs> Same question. Jordan, yeah. would you like me to repeat it? No, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, there's no magic wand that we can wave to create housing units in the city. Um, I, I wish it were otherwise, but it isn't. What I'd like to see us do as a city um, is create some incentives for de developers to create units uh, that would be available for us. Yes, that developers build things in. That, that's how it works. Um, if we need more housing, someone has to build it. Ultimately, I studied economics in university. First class is a class called Economics 101. They put a little graph up called the supply and demand graph. If the supply of something's low, the price goes up. If you want to create affordable housing, the best and surest way to do so is to increase the supply of units that are on the market that will naturally bring the price down, bring it into affordable areas. I'd also like to create programs 
working with industry so that when they build condominiums, a certain percentage of the condominiums would be for rental units only. So, so that would add units to the rental market. It would make it easier for people to find places. Thank you. Thank you. Stan, would you like to cash a chip for one minute on that question? Okay. <laughs> Next question. How do you think we can create greater mobility choices, biking, walking, and transit, in addition to cars, in the city and in Ward 9? The question goes to Stan. Well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, when I first got into this cab, I got to know this city darn well. You know, back roads, alleys, cut throughs, everything. I know how to buzz around. You know, as a matter of fact, coming up from Ogden, I just took the back roads. I didn't have to take the deer foot or anything like that. I just know how to zip around. Now, one of the things people look at is, oh, well, the bike paths, they've got to be on the main roads. No, they just have to be on the right path, you know, along the back, maybe through an alley, maybe uh, beef up the alleys a bit better, you know, coming all the way from here up in the north, all the way through, down Bridgeland, you know, the hill's a little scary, but, you know, it should be more bike orientated that way, not on the main roads. Uh, transit, uh, like I said earlier, inner city tourism. You know, if you're downtown, which I, I don't know if a lot of you, a lot of you work downtown, I don't know. You know, I don't. I work outskirts. You know, the traffic's coming this way, I'm going that way. No matter how I look at it, I'm going opposite of traffic. You know, which is a sweet deal for me. And uh, tr transportation within the inner city has to be more accessible. Uh, one, via inner urban tourism. I figured a bus, buzzing around like inner city, Inglewood, Bridgeland, doing a nice circle during the day, the night, $2, there you go, just constant. You always have it, you can always hop on the bus and go visit somewhere else. You know, this is the concept that should be happening. Throughout the Mission area, throughout Sunnyside, same thing. You know, it's all in the inner valley. You know, it's an easy way to set up a route, 14th Street, in Mission, come through 17th, down 1st uh, Street, kick into 9th Avenue. You can always have a bus buzzing around there, inner city tourism. You know, it's not, you know, where do we want the people to go? It's a matter of getting the people to where you want them to go. Inglewood, for example, you saw how it's coming up with the yuppies and everything like that. This is Thank what you. they want. They want Thanks people that. to accept it. They want people to go there and spend Thank money. You. But they don't want the three <laughs> 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 well, 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 I know. I saw the flag. Thank you. Uh, this question goes to one more time. Oh, same it's the same question. Me. Okay, I lost track. Same question goes to Giancarlo. Excellent. I'm very happy to be able to answer this question. Um, I think mobility choice in this city and expanding that is absolutely critical. If the next million people who live in Calgary have to live on the edge of the city and have to drive downtown and squeeze their cars along choked roadways, we're all doomed. We're doomed financially because we won't be able to afford the road system. We're doomed mobility-wise, and we're doomed from a lifestyle uh, perspective as well. The solution is building a, neighbor, a city of great neighborhoods, great neighborhoods that are linked by transit. And you actually have to create a critical mass of networked neighborhoods where they are walkable, complete, compact, with a full range of lifestyle options, and a full range of business opportunities, each with their own character, and then string them with transit. So it's much more convenient for you to walk or bike within your own neighborhood. And if you can't get what you need within your own neighborhood, it's much more convenient for you to hop onto the transit or move along a bikeway along a transit line to the next neighborhood or the next neighborhood or the next neighborhood. It's only at a critical mass of linked neighborhoods will a large and significant number of new Calgarians and existing Calgarians be able to choose more of a car optional lifestyle, more of an active transportation lifestyle. And that's not only something that we financially need to achieve, it's something that we, from a lifestyle perspective, absolutely need to achieve. And I think it's something that people want to live in because these are better neighborhoods, they're better lifestyle environments, and Calgary's going to have a lot of automobile-scaled environments for a long time. 
85% of Calgary was built since the end of the Second World War at the scale of the automobile. We need to start investing in the next city. And that's what the transformation of our planning process is called. It's called Next City. And we're starting to lay the groundwork for achieving all of that. And I look forward to another four years of actually delivering on that new system. Thank you. Nope, OK. Next question. Do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for Calgary? And if so, what will you do or have you done to address it? Jordan. One of the things that I love about Calgary, it's one of the best cities in the world to live in. It's absolutely fabulous here. Um, there's been a lot of discussion this campaign about urban sprawl. Does it cost $4,800 per house as we build out? You know, the, the cer certain people within the city have put that forward. Other people have suggested otherwise. The first problem we have is a question of transparency. When a developer gets a greenfield plot, they have to pay what's called an acreage fee, which is about $315,000 for every hectare. That money goes into the general uh, revenue fund for the city. And then as services are needed to be provided to link that new community to existing city services, the various departments draw out of their budgets. The first thing we have to do is I'd like to see those acreage fees go into a special fund to pay for services that go into new communities. That will be the quickest and easiest way to determine if there is a shortfall. If there is a shortfall, new communities should not be subsidized by our tax dollars in existing communities. If there is a surplus, as others are suggesting, then the opposite is true. The surplus that people are being charged for these levies should not go into services elsewhere. The first thing we need is we need the transparency to determine if, in fact, these numbers are true. And then we as a city can have an adult discussion on how best to address it. Thank you. Thank you. The same question to Stan. Would you like me to repeat the question? Urban sprawl. Well, urban sprawl. You know, uh, I go out in the outskirts of town and, you know, it provides me with the name. Oh, it just keeps going and going. If I do anything, the only thing I do with urban sprawl is I bring back that back alleys. You know, these houses that just look back to back on each other, that's disgusting. The only reason that's in is so that the developers can make more money by jamming more people in there together. And that's disgusting. No privacy. You're sitting there, you're in your living room, you're looking out the window at your food or whatever they're doing in their back window, right? Eh? This is what we have to address, you know, a little more uh, common sense in building these places, a little more uh, intelligence, you know, as opposed to dollars and cents. You know, the, the, the out there in the uh, suburb world, it's different. You need a vehicle, that's the way it goes. I prefer to keep my mind focused in on the inner city within 10 kilometers of the downtown core. Actually, five kilometers, because it's not even functional in five kilometers. Urban sprawl will always take care of itself as it develops. You know, all of a sudden, this subdivision's no good. Bam, it's going to get a revamp. You know, people come in, build up again. That's the way it goes as you build outwards. You know, if it's already there, it starts from inside, it starts building outwards. It always does that as you increase population. So that would be about it. Bring back the subdivisions, bring back proper subdivisions with alleys so there is proper privacy. A little more elbow room between the houses, you know. Going between some of these sound houses, I scrape my elbows and I'm pretty thin. You know, it's just wrong that way. Just to make a dollar. I'm going to add a couple of uh, commentary to that because I think I addressed sprawl in my previous comments. Uh, there are many definitions of what urban sprawl is. My definition is twofold. Number one, is the automobile the primary or only or overwhelmingly prevalent auto uh, mobility choice? then chances are you're pretty sprawled out and there's a lot of expenses associated with that. 
Number two, sprawl environments are unchangeable. They're built for a single purpose, and unlike urban environments, they're not designed to evolve over time, and that creates huge financial issues as well. Uh, we know from studies across North America that the automobile-scaled city has more infrastructure requirements than it has tax base to support it, and we know from our own infrastructure deficit that that's true of Calgary as well. Uh, this is a very healthy conversation to be having. The Municipal Government Act, oh, I'm not even going to be able to address that. That's too bad. I've got something really important to say. I'll try and work it in in a future Thank question. You. <laughs> We're going to take a short break now, 10 minutes, and uh, collect your questions for the Ward 9 candidates. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, I don't think I've seen a forum yet with so many questions from the audience. <laughs> Yay, audience. So, shall we get started? Sure. For Ward 9 specific, community specific questions. Nobody gets the red ones, by the way. Nobody gets the red ones. I know who's red and I know who. You know, don't try and cheat. <laughs> First question, if elected or re-elected, what will you do or could you do to encourage redevelopment of Edmonton Trail? Giancarlo. Well, Edmonton Trail right now operates as what I like to pejoratively call a, a car sewer. It's intended to be a cut through route. And it actually is the seam where several historic neighborhoods meet, where Crescent Heights and Renfrew meet, where Bridgeland uh, down in the couplet sort of comes together and meets the city, where Balmoral meets Mount View, and where Tuxedo Park meets Winston Heights. Um, traditionally in urbanism, those active seams where neighborhoods come together where there's higher traffic are main streets. And I had the opportunity to work with the U of C and with uh, the Calgary Foundation, the Winston Heights Community Association, Crescent Heights, Bridgeland, and Renfrew in successive years on visioning processes with students to start to lay out a future for this road as more than a car sewer for commuters moving through our communities and more of a scene where these neighborhoods meet. Uh, I am committed through my Great Neighborhoods platform to move to a process of planning where we sit down with every single community, we talk about the inevitability of change in our community, and rather than being victims of change, we take control and actively talk about the future we want for our community. And for me, it just makes a world of sense that Edmonton Trail evolves as a main street and the businesses that thrive along there and serve the communities also benefit from the through traffic. One of the things that we started to do is add um, on-street parking for those little pockets in Renfrew where there is an amazing business community growing up despite the hostile environment. And that has changed everything on the weekends. We're gonna be moving that pilot project to all off-peak times. And there's no reason why off-peak on-street parking, which is essential to retail success and works in all of our main streets, can't be applied on Edmonton Trail. Thank you. Same question. Jordan. <laughs> Thank you. One of the greatest things about our society is it's managed to develop itself without the intervention of government. And I think the businesses that we're seeing develop themselves on Edmonton Trail are a great example of that. Here was a demand for market. Businesses come into that demand and they provided services that people want. I fully support my friend here. See, buddy? I'll, I'll give him some kudos again when we start talking about off-peak parking on the streets. I think that's a fabulous idea. John Carlo is absolutely 100% right when he says that is a vital component for businesses to have success and it's programs like that that we should continue. I think through my experience I've seen time and time again when governments get involved in trying to pick winners and trying to pick losers that they're not nearly as good as the people who have success 
in business, bringing redevelopment, providing services that people want. And the city should be a partner with industry to bring residents here the sorts of services that they want, need, and are prepared to use. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, these guys have just been saying yaddy, 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 yaddy. <laughs> you know, what Edmonton Trail does mean is a constant increase of one commercial on the main floor and residential up above. What happens to a community? You need people to be able to afford the business. And if you don't start making it available to these people that want to invest in, in these resident and these commercial main floor things, they're not going to have anything. You need people around the neighborhood, you need proper parking. And I don't say, oh, because it's rush hour, you got to get off the road. Heck with that. Rush hour, stop. Check out the neighborhood. You know, why are you rushing through? You know, we got fantastic new stores coming in and out. One, a blanket thing for, uh, let's say, a coffee shop. How many coffee shops up and down Edmonton Trail? One, maybe. You know, and that's it. There should be at least a hundred up and down there. You know, realistically, isn't that right? Over the years that you've been living here, you know, Thank nothing you. has happened on Edmonton Trail, and uh, yadi 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 isn't going to tell us anything. Thanks, Dan. <laughs>
The mayor and I tackled this problem in 2010 as a major election issue and as a major pledge. And what we stated was that building a mobile home park on the east end of the city was financial madness for the city. It was interfering in the private marketplace in an untoward way. And most importantly, it was displacing people who were embedded in a community into a totally hostile environment, and that was unacceptable. Uh, it has been a long uphill battle. We have managed to nix and shut down the mobile home park on the edge of the city. That's not something our tax dollars should be losing money on. And we are now going to be working with the residents of Midfield to ensure as we build the mixed use, mixed income neighborhood that evolves there in phases over time, that everyone has the opportunity to participate in that neighborhood's life and that neighborhood's next life as they are able, whether it's affordable housing, seniors housing, attainable housing, Thank or whatever you. else. Next question, what's your plan of action for Lilydale? Jack Carlin. Excellent. Uh, Lilydale is the largest chicken abattoir in Alberta. It's basically inside uh, the community of Ramsey. It used to make sense to have an abattoir there. It was next to the stockyards. It was next to the Crossroads Market, which was a former slaughterhouse. Every single one of those businesses uh, evolved and went away, and this one remains. And it's hanging on by uh, its fingernails. I pledged in 2010 to pursue a carrot and stick approach. The carrot would be to work with Lilydale to remove them from the neighborhood. The stick approach would be to basically take all of the different minor bylaw infractions and weave and get coordination between the different city departments, wield it into a stick, and bring it down if necessary on Lilydale. Uh, we had a very exciting move forward plan working with the with the company. They had pledged by the summer of this past summer to have uh, a relocation strategy in place. They went dark about eight months before the summer, and it turns out that the guy who was leading Western Canadian operations was let go from the company. Very recently, we received um, a delegation from Lilydale that said, we can't afford to move unless it's a non-market deal. Uh, we need subsidies, we need help. Uh, what we are doing is we're sitting down with the mayor's office and them. We've already talked to Minister Kenny and Minister Rempel about finding agricultural grants. We need to do a land swap to move them out to the southeast. And we have to recognize that the Lilydale site is a super important site in the setway for a transit station to serve the major population density in Ramsey. Between all of those things, we're going to be able to get a move forward process that works. In the meantime, we're working with them on a, a good neighbor agreement, and that waxes and wanes depending on management at the plant on a day-to-day -day basis. But we're going to start Thank tightening you. the screws on them. Thank you. Same question. Stan. Oh. You know, I don't have any comment to make about the chicken factory. What can I say? Uh, I've been at the Shamrock a few times when it's been, uh, how do we say, uh, hot outside. And it sure flows through. You know, but, uh, it's, good to know, it's good to know that they're uh, considering moving out. You know, uh, a factory like Ch Lily Dale, I, uh, I really can't believe that they can't afford to move. You know, the amount of chickens that go through there, oh my. You know, the city shouldn't have to help them relocate. They should be able to afford it. And they should have enough assets in their back pockets to make them move on their own without city help. Jordan, would you like a minute on that one? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Ward 9 is blessed by some of the widest range of water courses in Calgary. If there's one thing that you learned from the flood, what would it be that you would take forward into office in the next four years? Jack Harlow. Thank you. Um, yeah, Ward 9 is blessed with an amazing collection of natural and working landscapes that are 
part of the historic soul of this city. Uh, we did take a beating for that, though, in the greatest natural disaster that's ever been visited upon us this past uh, spring, early summer. We have to pursue a three-pronged approach uh, to becoming more resilient and hardening ourselves against future flood events. Uh, number one, we need to work closely with the province on upstream mitigation. And there is a lot of work being done on that now, and there is a lot of political will to get it done. And it's important that we have a city council and a city councilor representing Ward 9 who has the appropriate relationships and respect at those levels of government to help influence outcomes. Uh, we are talking about flooding valleys in the headwaters and then detaining the water and then releasing it more slowly. We're talking about potential bypasses of the Glenmore Reservoir. On the city side, we need to address a number of on-the-ground potential solutions and our relationship with the province and actually delivering them. Inglewood, my backyard, actually has an amazing flood wall that was built and that I actually helped participate in getting built uh, that runs through public and private property and kept inundation out of the neighborhood. That kind of solution doesn't look like it's viable along the Elbow River, but there are other things that we need to pursue, and right now we're in the process of working out on them. The third component is really capturing how amazing citizens were, and I know all of the flood hit communities who did amazing organization, and we've got people from Inglewood who are central to that. We've got Danielle over here who manned the station in, uh, in Earlton. We need to start, as part of our community association and our community organizing, preparing for these kinds of disasters so we can be even better next time. Thank you. Same question to Stan. Hey, repeat the question. Ward 9 is blessed with some of the most diverse water courses in Calgary. If you could take one, if you learned one thing from the flood that you could take forward into office if you're elected, what would it be? Well, you know, the Bull River is quite a river. You know, one of the things I would do is uh, I try and put it back the way it was. You know, we got to live here. The more we let the river adjust, the less people are going to have their space and it's going to deteriorate. We end up putting it back together the way it was. You know, that's uh, within the Riverbend area. It'd be an amazing job, but this will be for future people to get at work, to help those youth that need a job. This will be a perfect opportunity where they can help with, with the community and help properly direct our river flow through our neighborhoods. And, you know, make it a fun thing to do. Like, you know, the Harvey Passage, maybe uh, keep it going all the way down right to the very uh, end of the city. You know, that's the kind of thing we should look at when we uh, rebuild our uh, river system. Elbow Drive, Elbow River, you know, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's got rich people on both sides of it all the way down. So you can't do much, you know, unless they want to put up a bird. Uh, as far as the uh, Bow River is concerned, it flowed pretty good, you know. It just got a little high. We dust off the mud and we keep on going. Me, let's use it properly. Let's make it flow properly. Let's rebuild it the way we like it. Thank you. Once again, my friend Giancarlo touched on a number of the pieces that are, are absolutely vital to protecting our city against the next flood. Uh, unfortunately, he forgot one. We have to dredge. We have to dredge the Glenmore Reservoir. We have to look at some of the river basins that have had a huge amount of debris placed in it, which reduces their capacity to handle future water. Ultimately, this is something that's going to be absolutely vital to our city to mitigate the damage of any future floods. So that's something that would be relatively inexpensive and it would be uh, relatively simple to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is more citywide, but comes from the audience. Will you support a bylaw, or would you support a bylaw restricting the use of pesticides for non-essential purposes? Oh, sweet. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, I don't believe.
believe in pesticides. You know, I believe in natural growing items. I don't like putting DET on my uh, potatoes or carrots or chickens or anything like that. Therefore, I'd be for that. You know, it's, you know, you don't need weed and feed on your lawn, it, especially when you can put in a natural, you know, compost on its own. Okay, that's about it. Thank you. One of the important things to remember about this debate is there is also consequences to not using pesticides. There, there are people who are allergic. There are people who are, are, are running through fields. Our children, if they're playing soccer, dandelions, when you slept, step on them, could actually cause a health risk to our children who are running through fields. They can slip on them because they are, in fact, very slippery. So as much as it sounds extremely popular and may seem as the right course to absolutely ban all pesticide use within our city, I think it's important before we move ahead with such a debate that we look at all sides of it and make sure that we come to a very, very clear decision. Thank you. Thank you. Martello, yes, no? I'm going to save my last chip. <laughs> <laughs> what do you consider to be City Council's role in supporting the arts in Calgary, and especially in Ward 9? Okay. Giancarlo. Well, I think that, uh, first off, I want to make the statement that investing in the arts has been unequivocally proven to um, improve the economic prosperity of the cities that, that have actually invested heavily in the arts. Uh, the City of Calgary has done some really good work with the establishment of the Calgary Arts Development Authority. And what I'm very interested in doing is making sure that we are benchmarking against other cities. And right now our investment in the arts is actually relatively low compared to other cities that we are competing with. Um, I also think that the city has a role in simply getting out of the way. And there are tremendous regulatory barriers to using um, spaces for, op for studios, using spaces for artistic purposes, that we need to simplify our bylaws. We need to create much more neighborhood and urban friendly bylaws. And that's, that's taking place under Next City. The other thing we need to do is we need to make sure um, that we are simplifying processes as much as possible. Right now we have a Calgary Arts Development Authority and we also have an arts division within city administration. And there are some weird and sometimes uncomfortable overlaps between those two organizations. And I think that part of the reorg that we're in the process of doing is really sort of looking at value for money and effectiveness of different organizations and different, kind of, uh, different kinds of organizational structures and making sure that we're putting most of the bang for the buck where it needs to be. Um, I'm a huge supporter of the arts, and uh, I love the fact that Calgary is emerging as an amazing art center and a place where artists are not dying to leave to better centers, but are also excited about staying and contributing. And so uh, I think that we have to continue investing in the arts. And we have to be smarter and better about it and uh, more about it Thank as you. we move forward. Same question. Thank Jordan. you. Arts are an absolutely essential part of any community. We need to have a beautiful city. We need to have a city that people can be proud of. One of the problems we have here is we have, as part of our, our capital uh, plan projects, a requirement to spend 1% of the capital cost on art. That's led to things like our, our big blue circle that we spent a half million dollars on. It, it's led to a million dollars worth of art in front of a sewage treatment plant that people are never going to see. I'd like to revisit that policy and eliminate, eliminate the cost-based side. Eliminate the 1% and instead Let's turn that into a local focus. Let's turn it into a program that's designed to develop and promote local art, local artists that makes sense for our city and that doesn't cost 
an absolute huge amount of money. To put into perspective the cost that we're going to be looking at with this program, when the southeast leg of the LRT proceeds, the city will be required to spend somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 million simply on art for that project. Let's instead look at projects that will help local artists, that will maintain the integrity and beauty of our city, and make, Cal make sure that Calgary stays a, a great and beautiful place to live in. Thank you. Thank you. How many like to uh, draw, do things, you know, all musical and stuff? Where can you go downtown to display them? Nowhere. They don't want you downtown. They want you to have money so you can buy this little space and rent it out and put up your display. Everybody uh, been to Quebec City? You know, you can go down an alley and there's like about a dozen artists going through the alleys that you do their drawings and no one's harassing them. They're doing their thing and they're showing and displaying their artwork. There's nothing like that in Calgary. And I'm shocked that the city hasn't made an effort. You know, like 17th Avenue. Oh, God, they got the park. Ooh, but they've changed it over and over just to make sure the people feel happy. But there are no artists. You know, they do a little drawing on there, but there are no real artists in this city that thrives. Who is the artist behind the, uh, the big blue circle? You know, who's the artist behind the fish on uh, Glenmore Trail? Ah, some rich guy. Thank you. You know. <laughs> Not the real people. No. I believe this will be the last question for the regular type of questions. And it will be, what, how do you plan to work with the community associations in Ward 9 to continue to provide the best services in each specific area? Jordan. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, Something I've talked about often is the, the importance of working with people for projects that they support locally. As your next alderman, I will work with every community association in the ward. I will work with them to develop projects that they believe in, projects that are supported by the community. Because ultimately, whatever happens, the people who live within those communities have to live with the projects and the decisions that are made at City Hall. So it's absolutely vitally important to me that as a council, we are working and promoting projects that are supported by the people who have to live with them. Thank you. Thank you. He doesn't live in the area, so what the hell does he know about our area? Edmonton Trail is an awesome place. I'd make sure that our communities are connected. One of the things I looked at is our community newspaper. You know, it's one over here, one over there, one over there. We're in Ward 9. Why don't we have a nice big community newspaper where we know what's going on in all our area? Not just a little piece of paper that says, okay, we did this, we have these people doing that. You know, we should have a nice newspaper come out here twice a month. That will help our community interconnect. Transportation amongst our community between way up here, Winston Heights, Mountain View, all the way down through the uh, Bank View, right into Inglewood, down into Ogden, yeah, God forbid, even River Bend and Acadia, you know, and back again. It should be a lot better on the east side than it is on the west side, okay, by having more access to our neighborhood people will be here first instead of going to the west side that's it i can use this anytime i'm gonna i'm gonna okay <laughs> i'm going to move on to the lightning how round at this point in random order, I'm going to take something from each of your platforms and ask you a 30-second question. Oh, and ask a question where you have 30 seconds to answer it. How you're going to implement something that you promised on your campaign mission? Stan. Stan. Stan.
seconds, what can you say about providing creative ideas for the growth of International Avenue? Ah, that's my old uh, leaflet. International Avenue, 17th Avenue. One of the things I wanted to do is say, hey, pick it from 28th Street all the way to Chesterville. Make it into a very unique mall, apartments, housing, condominiums, nice little river going down through it, half indoor, half outdoor. Give some people some place to hang out with and throw a LRT right through it or a transit system that goes right through it. It's an inner city concept and it's a big concept. Thank you. You have to understand it. Hopefully you. you do. But all the way out to Chester, that'll bring people into the city. Question goes to Giancarlo. Neighborhoods are where we live together. How are you going to respond to that through transforming local governance? I work very closely with community associations. I come from a community association background. My professional practice was deeply engaged in working with communities on the question of neighborhood change. I think that neighborhoods are not just the people who live there, they're the businesses that work there, they're the institutions that operate there, the schools, the churches, the special care providers. We need to develop a system of local governance based on a next generation community association that brings all of these groups together and that process is underway. Thank you. Thank you. And Jordan? Um, on traffic, how are you going to improve the services that the city provides to Ward 9 residents? Well, ultimately, there, there's three parts of my traffic platform. Um, the first is the timing of lights. Well, we have an issue with timing lights in the city of Calgary. We, we have to get it so that when you hit one green light, you get a green light all the way downtown. That will significantly improve um, the amount of volume that our streets can handle. Secondly, we need better uh, public transit, specifically the southeast leg of the LRT. And finally, we have to develop our roads and I'm done, so I'll stop talking. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was watching the clock. We have probably enough, you guys are uh, quick. 30 seconds was harsh, by the way. Yes, it's very, very harsh. <laughs> that was the idea. Uh, since you liked it so much, I can add an another one of those. <laughs> sure. If the people would like. Hey, 30 seconds <laughs> to Giancarlo. Mm -hmm. When you say it's our city, it's our government, they're our civil servants, how do you plan to address this by transforming City Hall? Okay, another exciting change that's underway is not only are we talking about developing uh, next generation community associations, but we're talking about taking our bureaucrats, our 20,000 civil employees, and redeploying them on the landscape as interdisciplinary civil service teams. That's an important part of the Great Neighborhoods platform, which is a three point, it's a five point transformation that I'm pursuing and I encourage everybody to read it. But this is work that's underway through inspiring strong neighborhoods through Next City and through tomorrow's workplace today, all explained in the platform. Thank you. Jordan? Mm -hmm. Property taxes and affordability, how will you represent Ward 9 on that issue? Well, ultimately there has to be an understanding that people pay taxes. We have families, we have seniors. Their incomes haven't gone up by 30% over the last three years. When city council imposes these sorts of tax increases on people, they have to understand people's ability to pay. These tax increases are well beyond what people can afford. As your councillor, I won't vote for these types of increases. They have to be within inflation. Thank you. <laughs> and Stan. How will you develop positive solutions in Ward 9 to educational, environmental, and transportation concerns? Yeah. One of the things I look at is how kids are being raised. Okay? They have no concept of the future. They have no concept of how seniors have to be. You know, and they're just told they have to learn, learn, learn. There's no time for them to learn. They have 
this thing that they gotta go through, they have that program and then they're told they gotta have, how do we say it, they gotta be a big business person, they gotta be, you know, how do you say, have a diploma per se so that they can uh, earn a lot of money. Thank you. I, <laughs> not enough, not enough. 30 seconds is tough. 30 seconds is tough. So you each now have one minute to <laughs> summarize <laughs> summarize your platforms and your message to voters of Ward 9. In random order, some of you may still have a chip, but uh, you have one minute left. Giancarlo. Okay. First thing I want to do is just give a shout out to some of the community leadership that's in this room. I mentioned Election Danielle, who did a lot of organizing in Earlton, and there's Peggy Wouts of the Bridgeland Community Association, and I miss you, and I'm sorry. There's a lot of presidents in this room, and I'm sorry if I've missed everyone, or anyone. Uh, I'm going to take some time uh, to talk about the numbers. We have, right now, the most fiscally responsible city council that we've had in living memory. Uh, the 30% tax increase are games with math. And the three ways in which you have an incredibly fiscally responsible city council are number one, we are transforming how city hall works. We are doing zero based budget reviews. We have an audit function that is actually functioning for the first time in decades. We're cutting red tape. And we're also redeploying our workforce who is well paid so we get more value for their services. Thank you. We also, I just burned a chip. One more chip. We also <laughs> are addressing the big structure. We are also um, addressing the big structural issues that are facing us. Number one, on the question of growth, we've made the statement that we actually have to grow smarter. Our taxes in the inner city should no longer be subsidizing growth on the end. And we've been working with industry to, uh, towards a 2015 goal of all growth covering its own costs. Most of industry has been on board with this transformation, we've been working together. Some members of industry, as you know from secret videos, are not on board and feel entitled to uh, continued corporate welfare. On the other side of it, for every dollar of taxes that Calgary pays to the three levels of government, every single kind of tax, we see eight cents on the dollar back as citizens of Calgary from our government. So one of the things that this city council has to do is fight to ensure that more and more of the taxes that we're already paying stay in Calgary and work for Calgarians. And that's what the $52 million are. That's what the $40 million was. Thank you. That's what the $10 and $5 million were. Thank you. One minute summary of Jordan, thank you. October 21st, six days from today. I can actually remember when it was 70 days. I can't believe we're here now. But on a side note, we're facing a very, very simple choice next Monday. Taxes have gone up 30%. Yes, it's the right math, John. We, we've seen $52 million taken away. We've seen zero-based budget reviews, but not zero-based budgeting, which are two entirely different things. There is now discussion <coughs> of a 14% property tax increase for next year. My friend John Carlo voted for every single tax increase you've received over the last three years. You can bet your bottom dollar he'll be voting for the 14% next year. It is time that City Council understands that when they raise taxes, Calgarians have to pay for those taxes, and those tax increases must be done in an affordable manner. Thank you. Sum up your position in one minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you like me, I will honestly uh, do the best I can. I promise it'll be honest, straightforward, and uh, you won't have to be uh, expecting me to take a consensus on things because I'm pretty sure I know what is needed in your neighborhood, our neighborhood in general. Uh, tax hikes, and eh, if you can't live within your means, you know. Feel free to vote yourself another raise, you know, because I can't do that when I work. Uh, 
I want everything, uh, education is important, seniors are important, you have to have more housing for these people, You've got to make sure it happens, and that's what I'm here for, make sure that the future happens. Thank you. And that wraps up our show. I'd like to thank everybody once again for coming out. I'd like to thank our generous sponsors for supporting the Civic Camp series of Councillor Forums. And if there's one message that you should leave here with tonight, it's vote next Monday. Yeah. Vote. vote. vote.